forgot the diving board, sorry. All right. It was baptism Sunday, and this one, one lady, Mrs. Brown was her name. She couldn't get her husband to uh, come to church with her. And uh, so she goes to church, the, the offering's being taken, and as the offering basket's going by, she drops her purse. And as it falls on the floor, a huge television remote control falls out. And the uh, usher picked it up, and he whispered, he said, do you always carry a remote control in your purse? And she said, no, just this Sunday. I wanted my husband to come to church with me, and he refused to come. And I thought this is the best way I could get even with them legally. <laughs> uh, we're so glad you're all here, all right? And uh, uh, we're going to be hearing testimonies in just a moment. We want to take a look at God's Word, what God has to say about things like baptism and so on. Baptism, by the way, is not a New Testament tradition. Baptisms were done before, before the church. Baptisms in the Old Testament were common as well. But they were a baptism of repentance. When a Gentile would become a, a Jewish proselyte, they would be baptized, symbolizing they were being washed. All of their Gentile attachments, Gentile backgrounds, was all being washed away, and they were now coming up out of the water as a clean Jew. They would also, they were also you'll remember John the Baptist, had practiced the baptism to repentance. When people were repenting of sins that they'd done, they'd be baptized, symbolizing they repented of that, and sometimes they had to be baptized again as they went and fell back into sin again, and so on. So baptism was not new to the church. The symbolism of it, that was very new uh, to Paul, when Paul writing to the, to the Romans, he tells them, as we've, we've gone through the book of Romans, those of you who are new here, we've just almost at the end of Romans now. But as we went, went through it, we discovered how Paul focused on the fact that we're all sinners, every one of us. There are no exceptions. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and all of us are destined to hell. We also discovered that God had provided a way for us through Jesus Christ. And when we, re, when we received him by faith, responded to him by faith, we were born again into a brand new life. And that born again was symbolized by baptism. Paul writes to the Romans, God's law was given, pardon me, I should back up a little more. Paul is saying that, that no matter how much we've sinned, God's grace is sufficient to cover our sin. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how little you've sinned or how much you've sinned. We are equally lost. And God's grace is more than sufficient to cover our sin, whatever those may be. You can't have sinned too much for God. You are not beyond the reach of God's grace. That's the amazing truth of God's word. Paul writes, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us a right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now there were some who were saying, well, if that's the case, if God's grace sort of expands, as it were, we take that picture, if God's grace is great to cover all of our sin, then if we want more of God's grace, we should sin more, right? Sort of on the surface, it kind of makes sense, right? If, if grace is, is the result or comes as a result of sin, if you want more grace, well, then you'll sin more. It seems that would be a win-win situation. God gives more grace. We receive more grace. Everybody's a winner. But Paul says, does it work that way? Paul says, well, then should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we've been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. So therefore, to keep on sinning makes no sense. Paul says it's just completely unreal. We were in Christ when he was crucified. Spiritually, we were in him, as it were. And when he died, it was as though we died for our sins. And then he was buried, and he rose again, and we rose spiritually, as it were, in him. We, too, have a new life when we come by faith. 
We have, we have new life in two ways. Number one, we have spiritual life. We now have power over sin. We have access to God in prayer. And we know we're going to have a new life someday, a new body someday, even as Jesus did. I'm going to have a new body, going to have a new life. That's the living hope of the believer, which is ours in Jesus Christ when he died and then was raised again from the dead. And uh, baptism now is a symbol of that new relationship that exists between us and Jesus. And it's a relationship that's established by faith, by receiving him as Savior and Lord. Paul wrote, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Jesus from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. What an amazing passage of Scripture, Paul says. We were dead and now we're alive. And there's a symbol to that. The symbol of this new relationship is baptism. This baptism doesn't initiate us into a relationship with Jesus. It just simply is a symbol of what already has happened. It's, it's something like a wedding ring. Romy, can I pick on you a little bit? Okay. I promise to embarrass you, all right? No, I'll try not to, all right? What is this? A wedding band. A wedding band. Would you take it, please? All right. You now have that symbol in your hand. Would you put it on my hand, please? All right. Does that mean we're married now? No. Why not? This is a symbol, though, isn't it? I didn't make a promise to you. You didn't make a promise to me. No, exactly. We didn't enter a, into a covenant relationship, all right? So it doesn't matter how many rings you put on my finger, it means absolutely nothing because there's been no covenant relationship, right? Now, do it again. Would you, would you put that ring on my finger? With this ring, I thee wed, yes. So we're married now, right? Because we entered into a covenant relationship, right? We did, many years ago. Now, notice this. This ring did not make me married with Romy because we did not enter into a covenant relationship. I entered into a covenant relationship with this gorgeous woman 47 years ago. Can you believe it? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, almost 48. And uh, this, this ring means something because we entered into a covenant relationship. Baptism is the same thing. It symbolizes a covenant relationship between you and God the Father. Baptism alone means nothing. Baptism alone does not save anyone. No one is ever saved by being baptized. No one's ever saved by simply wearing a ring. Or no one's ever married simply by wearing a ring. We have to enter into a covenant relationship. And so it is with Jesus. We enter into a covenant relationship by faith. And then baptism symbolizes what has happened. Baptism doesn't save anyone. Never has and never will. Baptism is a symbol of what already has happened. And so we have a group of kids here today, a group of people rather, who have very clearly demonstrated by their lives that they are new people. See, entering into a covenant, into a covenant relationship with Jesus changes us. He changes us. And that should be evident by the way we live. It should be very clear that we are new creations in Christ. The old has passed away. All things have become new. We now have power over sin for the first time in our life. We have power over sin. We are freedom from, free from things that used to enslave us, addictions of all kinds and those sort of things. We're able to break them. We're able to break uh, bad habits like anger and so on. How can we do that? We're in this covenant relationship with Jesus who's made us new. He comes and lives within us. He causes us to be born again. And so our old self died the moment we received Jesus as Savior, and the new was resurrected. Uh, and baptism is that amazing and wonderful symbol of that. Entrance into the kingdom should be baptized as a public declaration of being transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, from death to life until the end of the age, Jesus said, baptism is to be a practice of the church, of the Christian family. Jesus said, or, or Matthew writes rather, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. So baptism as a public symbol is going to carry on until Jesus comes again. 
there's something about baptism that's powerful. I was reading this past week of a missionary from the Philippines who was back in North America saying that in the territory where they were working, to be baptized, to accept Jesus as Savior didn't cause a lot of ruffles anywhere, not a whole lot at all, until they were baptized. The moment they were baptized, that's when trouble began. Now, I don't know why Jesus said that we all have to be baptized publicly. Why can't it be done privately? Jesus said it's just done publicly and open. Why? I believe it's because it does a number of things. One, it just declares very clearly, I'm a believer in Jesus. I want the world to know. I want the world to know that I, I'm walking to the beat of a different drummer. And I think the other thing is it gives an opportunity this way to speak about Jesus' tremendous grace and love to a whole body. When I was in Ukraine, uh, one of the things we were told there is they, they never had funerals in a church and they never had baptisms, baptisms in a church. I said, why not? They said, well, we have, when we have a funeral, we just conduct them, the, the message or the service rather in the cemetery. And everybody around can hear. We have loudspeakers, so the word goes out. Many can hear. And baptisms are held publicly the same way that those who are curious and observing hear the gospel. I really believe that's one of the reasons why Jesus declared baptism was to be done and done in a public way. That was the example that we see again and again. And it's an example that we've been transferred, or it rather speaks to the fact that we've been transferred from death to life. Paul writes to the Colossians, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. All right, we've got six people today, four tonight, that are going to be standing in front of us here sharing their testimony and saying, I've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. I am a new creation. I was made new when I received Jesus as my Savior. And I want the whole world to know about this. And that's why we're doing this publicly and live streaming it and all those sort of things, all right? So today the baptismal candidates are Joanna T Jana Toes, Avery Friesen, Kendra Penner, uh, Kendra Friesen, Maya Claussen, and Elena Claussen. They're going to come up in the order which they themselves have, have determined. They, uh, now, by the way, I want to just add one more thing. If you know Jesus as your Savior... My next question, or that was a statement, or asked it. It's going a bit fast. <laughs> if you know Jesus as your Savior, have you been baptized? If not, why not? If you know him and have not been baptized, it's either you're living in willful disobedience to God's word that you just didn't know, that, that you knew but just decided not to do this, or maybe you're not a believer. See, God's word makes it clear that believers should be baptized. And so if you haven't been baptized yet, I want you to see Pastor Randy or myself. Uh, Randy's a good-looking one, all right? I'm the old one. And uh, you, come, you come talk to us, and we'll be more than happy to arrange for you to do a baptism again sometime in fall, all right? So if you've not been baptized, but you know Jesus as your Savior, the excuses are all gone. They're all off the table now, all right? God's Word says to be baptized. Come and see us. We'll make sure it happens, all right? So I'm looking forward to the favorite part of the service today. You thought it was me, didn't you? Don't answer that, all right? <laughs> it's actually the testimonies we're going to hear in just a moment. And so uh, we're going to begin with Joanna. Would you come up, please? And then you'll follow in the order which you have yourselves determined. What's going to happen is Joanna's going to come up and share her testimony. Then she's going to be baptized. And the next one's going to come up. All right, Joanna? Oh, here you are. Hello. My name is Joanna Toes, not Taves. <laughs> I am the oldest daughter of Alvin and Martha Toes. I was born in Limo Plata, Paraguay on June 18, 1999, and my family moved to BC when I was just four and a half years old. I am blessed to be able to say that I grew up in a Christian home with parents who only ever wanted the best for me. So thank you, Mom and Dad, for everything. Truth be told, I don't remember how old I was the first time I accepted Jesus into my life. Growing up, people around me knew that I went to church and youth or that I didn't swear, but I didn't truly know what surrendering my life to Christ really meant. By the beginning of grade nine, I'd gotten to a point where I had to have everything in my life the way that I thought it should be. I had straight A's. Anything lower was not good enough. I could do better. I joined all the sports teams they would let me, cross country, field hockey, basketball, co-ed rugby, track and field, well, you guys get the idea. I always told myself that grades were important, 
graduating high school was important, and of course, the big, you don't get very far in life without a university degree speech you get every year was important. As a young kid, I always thought that being a Christian meant that you didn't have big problems. I don't know where I got that idea from, but I laugh at just how wrong that statement really is. I could definitely say during this time of my life, I sometimes wondered if there really was a God out there, and if there really is, or was, why did it feel like I was alone? However, I never really talked about it because how could I be a Christian but be struggling with, struggling and even questioning my faith? The end of September had come around and my youth group was planning on going to a youth conference called Campus Sunfire. I wasn't too excited about it. It was on a Friday night and I wasn't really into the idea of going. I had wanted to find other plans for that evening, but when my youth pastor asked if I was planning on coming, I hadn't come up with anything else, so I told him that I'd go. Going there, I didn't expect much to come out of this conference, if I'm being honest. I just hoped that it would be worth the $15 that I spent to go. <laughs> Let me tell you, that was probably the best $15 I have ever spent. There came a point during that evening where they asked us if we wanted a closer relationship with God and what that truly meant. At first, I didn't quite know if that was what I wanted. Did I really want to do that? Did I want to surrender every control I had in my life over to God? As I, reflected, as I reflected on what had been happening in the past couple of months, I decided that yes, this is what I wanted. Coming out of that conference, I no longer felt the heaviness I thought was normal. I had never felt that light before. I didn't feel the pressure of worrying about other people's problems or even my own anymore. I finally felt God's grace. I felt completely free and at peace with myself and God. This is when I completely, 100% gave my life to God and I knew that he was never going to leave me. I never had to carry burdens on my own again because he was always there and would continue to always be there. I knew, that from, I knew from that moment forward that God was real, God was present, and that God would always be there for me. This is what I held on to whenever I felt discouraged about anything. Fast forward to senior year of high school. I made plans to grad early, so that meant freedom came in February. <laughs> By this time, I planned out what I wanted to do with my life, where I wanted to go to school, where I eventually wanted to live, what I wanted to do. But this all changed when my dad told me one evening that he felt God calling him to move his family to Manitoba. When he said that, I felt as though my world came crashing down around me. I literally could not breathe. Everything I had worked towards and wanted was going to change. I did not take that very well. I mean, Manitoba? Really? <laughs> Why? <laughs> I was so angry at God. Things had been going so well for me. I was involved in my church, had amazing friends, applied for the university that was 15 minutes away from my house that I knew I would get into, and my whole family still lived together. It couldn't get much better than that, and now it felt like he was taking that away from me. I'm quite stubborn sometimes, and there's a running joke in my family that it comes from the toes side. So I told my family that I was not going to move, and that was that. I was going to find a job, find a place to rent, and continue to live in Abbotsford with my friends and my future plans. Well, things didn't turn out the way that I wanted them to. No matter how many doors I always tried to open, it felt like God was there closing them, always closing them. After facing reality, I told my parents that I would move with them, but that I was going to move back to Abbotsford at the end of August for university. When we moved, my dad told me that one day I would thank him for moving us out here, and I said, yeah, okay, dad, yeah, right. As my mom and I were driving through Grunthal, I remember saying, who would choose to live here? <laughs> they don't even have a street light. <laughs> I couldn't wait to move back to BC and be with my friends. I was still so angry at God. I didn't think that it would be possible to find another church that could even come close to the one we had back in BC. After trying a few different churches, we came to the Berg. The first time I stepped into this church, I felt at home. I knew that if I wanted to get to know people, I had to make an effort, so that is one of the reasons why I went to college and career. As an outsider coming into a small town, you really have to put yourself out there. Not only do you not know anything about anyone, you have to be the one to ask all those questions everyone else already knows the answers to, like, where do you work? Or, oh, you're related to so-and-so. <laughs> During this time, my mom had asked if I had applied to any, uni uh, any universities in Manitoba yet, which I wasn't even considering at the time because I had already made up my mind about moving back. 
After thinking about it, I decided to apply at the University of Manitoba, just as a joke, really, not taking it seriously because I knew what I wanted, right? You would think I got the hint already, but nope, apparently not. Only a few weeks had gone by before I got my acceptance letter to U of M, and I could not believe it. I still hadn't gotten my acceptance letter from the University of the Fraser Valley, the school I'd wanted to go to. So I prayed about it, and I know that you're not supposed to bargain with God, but I told him, okay, if I don't get an acceptance letter within the next four weeks, I will go to U of M and stay in Manitoba. Because I'd applied way earlier for U of V than I did for U of M, I was sure I would, get, I would be getting something in the mail soon. Every day I checked my email to see if I'd gotten anything from U of V, and every day was the same, nothing. Eventually those four weeks flew by, and I still hadn't heard anything back from U of V, so I accepted my offer at U of M. Not even a full week later, I got an email and a letter from U of V saying I got accepted into the program I wanted. Not even a full week later. I was so frustrated because I had given it a month to come and nothing. Then a few days later, I get it. Although staying in Manitoba wasn't what I wanted, I knew that God wanted me here and he had made that quite clear. After I made that decision to stay, I slowly began to like living here. I wasn't angry at God anymore, but instead I realized what he had saved me from. Looking back, I see that I had gotten so comfortable with the way I was living my life that I had stopped asking God about what he wanted for me, and instead I asked myself what I wanted. My relationship with God had become lukewarm, and I hadn't even realized it. Moving to Manitoba and becoming a part of this church has been more of a blessing than I could have ever imagined it to be. So thank you once again, Mom and Dad, for moving us out here. Oh, I messed up my line. <laughs> I meant to say, so thank you once again, Dad, for moving us out here and mom for always praying for me, especially when I felt so lost. I've grown in my faith in so many different ways and I have experienced some amazing things happen this past year. Even during these past few months, I learned that it isn't about what the world thinks you should do with your life, but it's about what God wants you to do and what you are doing to make that happen. This morning, I want to get baptized because I want to publicly declare that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I will follow him wherever he leads me and my hope is that when people look at me, they first and foremost see the love that Jesus has for them. A verse that has helped me so much this past year is found in Psalm 30, verse 14 to 15. But I am trusting you, O Lord, saying you are my God, my future is in your hands. I went from being lukewarm to on fire for God, and all it took for me was moving three provinces over onto a farm located in the middle of nowhere, joining a church in a small town, and of course, learning to be patient and listen to what God wants me to do. But I mean, not everyone is a toes, so it might not take you that long to figure it out. <laughs> Speaking of lukewarm. Joanna, have you repented of your sins, asked and received forgiveness through Christ's shed blood, and do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Yes, I do. Do you desire to be baptized upon this confession of faith? Yes. All right, put your feet right up here. There okay. You go. Yep. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death, <laughs> raised to walk in newness of life. My name is Avery Friesen. I don't do a lot of public speaking, so what better time to get my feet wet? Um. <laughs> I'm part of my dad's front row Friesens, so <laughs> you probably see me more than I see you because I'm not going to go rubber necking and look behind me to see who's all there. I was raised in a Christian home with my parents and my brothers. I was and am a pretty well-behaved child, 
and I am proud of it and the way my parents helped with it. While, God, while talk of God was happening at home and at children's church, I didn't really understand it a whole lot because I was only like three or four years old. I started learning about God when I started going to Sunday school, even though I only started to understand him and the Bible around eight to nine years old. But the thing that I was brought the closest by was going to youth here at the Burke Teller. The teaching felt like it was aimed and directed just for me. My second year memory verse was in Acts 2, but in there was something that really stuck me, well, struck me. It was Acts 2, 27. It says, because you will not abandon me till the realm of the dead, you will not let your Holy One decay. It sticks out to me because while our choices can lead us to destruction, he says he will uh, stay with me through all my struggles and wants to carry me when I fall. One thing that we do at youth retreats is we have what's called a retreat of silence which is when we get to go individually to pick a spot where we can read the Bible and go to any random spot in the Bible. There was a verse I found during one of these. It was Proverbs, Proverbs 3, verse 5. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. I have not talked about this one a lot, even though I have no idea why. But for me, it is really good to know that we can trust him and he is never wrong and he knows exactly what we are going to do in our future by the time we were even born. And even when things get hard, we can still trust him. In my future, I also want to help others with their walk of God because sub God, sometimes people need the help when they, even when they do not realize it. With me, I had all the help I could get. I had my mom and my dad, or Terry and Irene, my brothers, Merritt and Bryson, my sister-in-law, which was here, Chelsea, um, the pastors, Pastor John and Pastor Andy, where, Pastor Andy there, um, forgot where he was, okay, my mentor Ryan, which, somewhere over there, still haven't found him, and my friend Ethan, which is also there. Um, there was also Veggie Tales to help, but... They were always good examples to, for me to follow. Well, maybe not always, but a lot of the time. Sometimes the devil will try to get a hold of me and try to get me to do something stupid. But 90% of the time, one of them will try to stop me before I even do it. I used to only read my Bible when I went to youth or Sunday came around. But I need to read it more to help me progress and understand God better and learn how that way I can trust him more. And I want to get baptized because I want to proclaim to the world that I'm a follower. of your sins, ask and receive forgiveness through Christ's shed blood, and do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? I do. Do you desire to be baptized upon this confession of faith? I do. I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death, <laughs> raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> My name is Kendra Penner. I am the youngest daughter to Terry and Laura Penner. I was born and raised in a Christian home, and I am beyond thankful for the family God gave me. I accepted Jesus into my heart when I was approximately five years old with the help from my oldest sister, Corey. At least that's what they tell me. During my childhood, I asked God to come back into my heart on a regular basis. I didn't understand that he wouldn't leave just because I had sinned. I attended Sunday school, prayed, and read my Bible often, and went to church almost every Sunday. But then I started to grow up. I would only read my Bible just to say I read it, 
but I didn't actually try to understand it or follow it. Once high school came, specifically grade 11, I started looking for a part-time job. So I began juggling work, school, and family, and God was put on the back burner again. I became stressed as school got more intense as I was taking pre-cal, physics, and chemistry all in the same semester. There was a lot of negativity in my life, which caused me to become discouraged. I was a people pleaser. I wanted people to like me. I wanted to help people, show kindness, impress my teachers, my boss, my parents, and please God. I expected too much of myself and put too much into my job, too much to excel at school, and tried to be a good friend and daughter. It got exhausting. I let people walk over me and take advantage of my kindness. I knew I was a sensitive person, person which caused me to be hurt easily. So instead, I became negative, angry, bitter, and I distanced myself from my friends and my family. I was lost. I claimed to be a Christian, although I didn't really live it. I still believed in God, but I rarely prayed. Never read my Bible and ignored him. I would pray for answers about hard decisions, but I never listened because I was scared of the answer I was going to get. I didn't trust him. I was a part-time Christian who demanded a full-time God. Having so much anger and negativity in me, I started to become selfish. I didn't care about others and the struggles they were experiencing, only my own. I didn't want to be the center of attention, but I wanted someone to care enough to know I wasn't okay. But I did have someone. I had multiple people. I had God, my family, and friends who were always there for me, supporting me. College started at the beginning of November. Going from being surrounded by believers to a full class of non-believers was hard. I would drive to St. Vitale and take a transit bus to school. I prayed every day for God to protect me. I don't know how I made it to school some days. I finally got a good routine going with driving and busing every Monday to Thursday and working on the weekends. Once I had my routine down, I found a letter on my car getting, after getting off the bus. It was a notice saying I had to find a different place to park. I was so frustrated. However, God was answering my prayers. He was protecting me. I found a new bus route that was safer and the bus drivers were nicer. The, driver, the bus driver that I had after class every day told me he was watching out for me and that he would even wait at the bus stop till I got on it. I've made, chances, I've made changes in my life the last few months. Little changes like listening to praise and worship music throughout the day, reading the Bible on bus rides and praying for others. Those little changes make a huge difference in my life. My whole day is better because my attitude and outlook on life change. I feel his joy and love for others. I like having my ducks in a row, but I know God has it under control. A verse that helped me when I had doubts was Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God has always been there for me. He answers my prayers, even if it's not the answer I wanted. His plan is always better. He removed people from my life that didn't align with his purpose for me and placed positive, encouraging people. Another verse that really stuck out to me this week was 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10. I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In order to be strong, you have to be weak first. I am weak without God. I have learned to give everything to God, and we can do all things through Christ. Today, I am getting baptized to publicly declare my love and devotion for Christ. Kendra, have you repented of your sins, asked and received forgiveness through Christ's shed blood, and do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? I do. Do you desire to be baptized upon this confession of faith? I do. All right, yeah, go right up there. Baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life.
Hi, my name is Kendra Friesen. I'm a daughter of Mona Friesen and Ken Fraser. My parents are not married. When I was about two or three, my real parents split. My brother Jackson was born on April 27, 2009. Then I was one years old. When I was four, a new guy, new guy moved in and his name was Wyatt. But then we moved again when I was about five. So we moved to a new neighborhood and school. A little after, my grandpa and uncle moved in. My new school, in my new school, I was a very mean kid. I would say mean, mean things and do mean things. One day, my mom and Wyatt were gone for eight days. Then a lady at our, was at our house and she introduced herself and said what she was doing here. She said that she was a social worker and drove us to school. So then I'm not quite sure what happened, but I was at a new place and I slept there. I think someone said I was in foster care. I stayed there for a month or two. I had no friends there, so I was lonely. I moved again. Finally, there was a girl that I could play with. But then after about a year, she moved. Two new kids came, a girl and a boy. They stayed for about two months. Then they moved, then they moved, but after a week they came back. Then they moved again. One day I went to the doctor to get needles, but I refused. After I moved to Uncle Jeff and Auntie Janice, who now I call mom and dad, dad and I had a long conversation about me not taking the needles and about saying yes to God and no to myself and obeying him. That moment, I decided to ask Jesus into my heart and I was a whole new person. I had the needles and it was terrible. <laughs> After that, on a Sunday, I memorized my first Bible verse. Romans 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The prayers that God has answered for me is for a forever home and so my mommy can go to rehab and get better. My mommy did go to rehab, but then she was, but when she was able to go places by herself, she decided to run away at night. Ever since then, she hasn't gone to rehab. So now that I have Jesus in my heart, I've been praying for her. School has been going good ever since I changed, school, changed schools. I had a choice to go back a grade, so I did, and I'm glad I did. The reason why I'm here getting baptized is so the whole world knows that I've made a decision to follow God and obey Him. The first time I was here for bap baptism, I felt God calling me to get baptized. Have you repented of your sins, asked and received forgiveness through Christ's shed blood, and do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? I do. Do you desire to be baptized upon his confession of faith? Okay. Cross your arms. Yeah. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Maya Clausen, daughter of Eric and Roxanne Clausen. I was born into a, Christ, a loving Christian home and accepted Christ into my heart at a young age, probably four or five. I remember going to church and Sunday school, attending youth and summer Bible camp. 
I have been so blessed to have Jesus with me my whole life. Growing up and learning more and more about God each year, I have come to a place where I ask myself, why am I not baptized? I believe in God, I believe he saved me from my sin and loves me so much, so why am I not baptized? Well, after today, I won't have to ask myself that question anymore. I'm getting baptized today to symbolize what Jesus did when I became a Christian. In Romans 6, verse 3 to 4, it says, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we may too live a new life. Let me share a few ways that this new life is becoming a reality. For three-ish years, I was afraid of the dark and going to bed alone. But then one day in Kansas City at a Hillsong concert, I was set free from the bondage of fear. Prior to this experience, I had asked God many times, why haven't you set me free? Why am I still afraid? I had prayed about it, and I had read much scripture about it, but nothing happened, and I was very frustrated. At the concert, a guy was speaking about fear, and God was totally speaking through him directly to me. Then the band sang the song, Prince of Peace. It was during that song that I heard God speak to me. He said, this is the moment I have been waiting for. Instantly, my fear disappeared, and I was filled with peace. My fear of being alone and of the dark was gone, but also my fear of others' judgment. I was free to worship and cry and dance. Another amazing God experience happened last summer. One of my best friends almost died, but through the miraculous power of God, he was healed. Praise God. Uh, God showed me his amazing protection over his children and healing through prayer. God has also taught me and showed me his unfailing love through his word and through my mom. God has taught me so much, and I'm continuing to learn more and more about my new life in Christ. Thank you. Maya, have you repented of your sins, asked and received forgiveness through Christ's shed blood, and do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? I do. Do you desire to be baptized upon this confession of faith? I do. All right. Maya, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> My name is Elena Clausen. I'm 18, and I'm the eldest child of Eric and Roxanne Clausen. My life probably started similar to most of yours. I was born here in Manitoba into a Christian family. The first few years of my life were pretty average, and I accepted Christ into my heart with my grandma when I was about four, according to my grandma. I don't really remember it, but I know it was real because early on that relationship with Jesus was real to me. Of course, as a four-year-old, I didn't really know what I was doing or getting myself into. Elementary school was again pretty average. I had friends and almost no worries about life. Middle school is when the reality of life took over my world and when Satan started shaking my core. He tries to attack when we are young, unsure, and vulnerable. And that's exactly what he did, and he used kids my age. Starting in just grade three was the first time I felt real rejection. By the time grade seven came along, I had completely embraced the lies and had become an entirely different person. It's interesting how your behavior changes when you, believe, when you begin to believe the lies. In grade eight, I remember sitting by myself by the garbage can during some recesses and singing praise and worship songs to myself that I had heard in church or that I had listened to at home. Almost every day I would come home feeling down or crying and my amazing mom would be right there to comfort me. She was and still is my best friend and we had a lot of deep, meaningful talks late into the night. I do remember one specific recess time in grade eight. I was sitting by myself crying about some mean thing my friend had said to me when this girl came up to me and stood beside me. I had no idea who she was other than that she was a year older than me 
And I don't even remember exactly what she said, but she did ask if I was okay, and I do remember her just standing there beside me in silence for the whole recess. I have no idea who that girl is, but I will never forget her. Right from middle school, my relationship with God was pretty strong. I would talk to him all the time and would always be praying. This verse comes to mind when I think about those times. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like the little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. My faith as a child was stronger than it was going, when going through high school. During the summer, I would always go to Rose River Bible Camp, crying the first day and begging to stay when my parents came to pick me up. I always loved it there. I would always have an amazing time making new friends and having cabin leaders that would be genuinely invested in me. I always felt so, so loved and would come back very encouraged. One year, I'm not, exactly how sh I'm not exactly sure how old I was, probably 12 or 13. I'd been struggling with the idea of God's love. How could he love me? I was so insignificant, and I hadn't really done anything to deserve his love. How could this God of the universe love little Elena? I knew in my head that he loved me, but I didn't understand in my heart. And I remember uh, specifically sitting on our kitchen counter, mom trying to explain his love for me and just not understanding. That summer, I went to camp again, and during one of the evening chapels, we sang the song, The Stand, by Hillsong. And in the middle of the song, it hit me like a brick wall. I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned, in awe of the one who gave it all. So I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrendered. All I am is yours. I remember sitting down on the pew, the music rang faint in my ears, and I just sat there stunned. Somehow it clicked, and I started crying because I finally understood God's love for me. It was so powerful, I couldn't do anything else but sit there and weep. After chapel, I talked to my cabin leader and rededicated my life to Christ. That is one revelation God has given me, and sadly, it didn't last very long. Only for those few weeks, I understood his love for his children, but as soon as school started again, I got distracted by the lies and lost sight of the truth. A couple years later, I went to camp to do the CLP program, cabin leader prep. I absolutely loved the first two weeks. I absorbed everything they taught us and loved being in a big group. The third week, not so much. The first day as a cabin leader, the campers came and I was disappointed with my cabin girls. I didn't get the ones I wanted, um, which sounds terrible, but I was so immature and not ready for what was to come. My co-cabin leader had never been to Rosa River, so I practically had to lead everything by myself, teaching her and the girls. Um, during the week, one of our cabin uh, girls ran into the bush at 10 in the evening. After searching and finding her, my co-leader broke down and left me for the night. I was so stressed, and it was by far one of the worst weeks of my life. I was put in a position I wasn't ready for, and God really stretched me throughout that week. I cabin led for two summers uh, after that, and those summers really pushed, uh, pushed me to trust God. My relationship with the Father really bloomed in those summers. I was constantly in prayer and leaning on Him. One verse that... I came back too often, and it's still one of my favorite verses, is Isaiah 43, verse 4. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. The end of high school was definitely better than middle school, and one of my teachers really helped me to find myself through his class and revive the Elena God had created me to be. I'm very thankful for this teacher because I don't think I would be the same if it were not for him. At the end of high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I knew that I had a passion for Jesus and music, so I got a job at co-op. Just kidding. <laughs> College and career has also really helped me grow in my faith, and since I started going, I have felt my passion and fire for Christ grow, and I know I have grown in knowledge and trust. My mom asked me a question a couple of months ago. When do you feel the deepest connection to Jesus? I thought about it, and I knew it was when I was playing or listening to music. I don't even know how to describe it. Music just touches my heart in such a personal way. When I play piano or guitar and sing, I feel as though all my senses are heightened and I feel complete peace and overwhelming joy. I know God has given me this as a gift to enrich our relationship and I want to continually grow in it to serve and bring him glory. A couple of years ago, a serious but non-life-threatening medical issue came up in my life. When I learned what it was, I was instantly broken. How could my heavenly father allow this to happen to me? My first reaction was to run away from God, but I learned very quickly that that is not possible. And it is when we are pushing God away that when he is closest to us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. This situation has really brought me to my knees, pressing me to constantly be in prayer and to fully put my trust in him, knowing he has a plan for my life. He is in control and he is a loving God, uh, no matter if I get healed or not. Nothing about my medical issue has changed, uh, but my attitude towards it and my Heavenly Father has. And my faith has just grown stronger because of it. When we went to Hawaii in February, we spent a lot of time at the YWAM base in Kona. There I got to listen to a speaker, Dan Bauman. 
He has an amazing testimony, and one thing he said that, uh, that really stuck out to me was, everything you do should come out of intimacy with God. I was confused at first, and now I am slowly learning what intimacy with God looks like. We listened to another speaker, and almost everything he said stretched my thinking, making me realize I have so much more to learn. I would like to share one more story with you. One day in April, I was working at co-op, and, and a guy came in, not the typical type you come across in Grenfell. He was African-American and had an English accent. He explained his whole story. Basically, he was lost trying to get to Steinbach. He had no gas in his car, no money, and he needed Wi-Fi to transfer money onto his debit card. We don't have free Wi-Fi at co-op, and the two co-workers I was working with had no idea how to help, so they suggested walking down Main Street to look for Wi-Fi. <laughs> Suddenly, I got this nervous feeling uh, I get when I'm about to go on stage to do a play. Later, my mom explained to me that she feels this way when the Holy Spirit is guiding her. He was about to start walking when I said, you know what, I'll direct you to Steinbach and I'll put $20 gas in your car. He looked stunned and I smiled pleased from his reaction. No, no, I can't let you do that, he insisted. I told him I didn't know how else, how else he was going to get out of Grunthal. <laughs> <laughs> he asked my name and when I worked, continually thanking me. He said he'd come back to pay me, but I insisted that this was a gift. After he left, I walked inside and explained the situation to my coworkers. They instantly said, why didn't you just give him $10? That's all he needed to get back to Steinbach. <laughs> he was probably lying and trying to scam you. For a second, I thought, yeah, Elena, what were you thinking? Now you just wasted $20 of your hard-earned money. But then I thought about Jesus and when he helped people in need. Did he ever give just enough? No. He always gave much more. When we deserve death, he gave us life and the chance to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. I love seeing how the Holy Spirit used everyday life to teach me truth. Right now, I have no idea what the future holds, but I know that God has big plans for me, and I know that whatever he has planned is good, because as my dad says, he really likes us, and he is a good, good father. Honestly, when I was writing this story, I thought, this is going to be boring and average, but a very wise person told me, this is the story God gave you. I'm getting baptized today because in the Bible, it says, believe and be baptized. Baptism is kind of like the wedding ring that symbolizes a marriage. Since we are the bride of Christ, united with him in death and in new life, it, as it says in Romans 6, uh, we get baptized as a symbol of that. And so I want to do that. I want to follow my Savior all the days of my life, and this is just the next step. Have you repented of your sins, asked and received forgiveness through Christ's shed blood, and do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? I do. Do you desire to be baptized upon this confession of faith? I do. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Wasn't that amazing? Yeah, thank you so much, all of you who shared your testimonies. It was, uh, that was a real ministry. I, I had the chance to hear them twice. We heard them this morning earlier, and then again, and now.